planet Earth is bathed in warmth as it orbits close in to our mother star, the Sun. The size of our planet is perfect for gravity to attract a thick atmosphere and allow oceans of liquid water to pool on the surface. For us, it's paradise. But how many other worlds just like it are out there? Scientists look to distant stars, hoping to find similar warm, wet planets. What they find is shocking. In the region where the Earth sits in our solar system, astronomers find a very different type of planet. When we look around the galaxy, we see that the most common type of terrestrial planet is what we call a super-Earth. The term super-Earth refers to a planet, a solid planet, that is somewhere between three and five times the mass of the Earth. And amazingly, these are the most common types of planets in the universe. Super-Earth planets are so common around sun-like stars that astronomers now think our ancient solar system may have had a family of super-Earths too. This long-lost family of worlds would have orbited close into the sun. So close that some of their surfaces could have seethed with molten rock. Today, large super-Earths are nowhere to be seen in our solar system. But if we did have them, where did they go? And how did the Earth and other rocky planets come to take their place? The answer could lie in the chaos of our fledgling solar system, when newborn planets were jostling for their position in the cosmos. These things were in all different orbits, elliptical orbits, and they would get close to each other. And so you were constantly seeing collisions between these things. It wasn't like cars on a racetrack. It was more like a demolition derby. There were planets that probably got ejected from the solar system entirely. There may have been planets that were actually thrown into the sun. But were these mythical super-Earths really destroyed this way? A new theory suggests that Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, may have been responsible for sending the super-Earths to their doom. Today, Jupiter sits almost 500 million miles from the sun. But in the early days of our solar system, Jupiter most likely migrated in towards the super-Earths. This trajectory creates cosmic carnage. There's evidence of migration of some of the giant planets in other solar systems, and so we think that that same kind of process may have happened in our own solar system. This is the theory. 4.5 billion years ago, Jupiter spirals inwards through a young solar system. Its immense gravity smashes the forming planets together and snow plows their corpses towards the sun, piling up a gigantic ridge of rubble. The pile of rubble meets the family of super-Earths. It disrupts their orbits. Eventually, they collide causing a planetary pileup that annihilates the super-Earths and leaves a cosmic wasteland in their wake. Is Jupiter really responsible for the death of the super-Earths? In Switzerland, scientist Farhang Nabi searches for evidence that long-lost planets once roamed our solar system. Farhang studies a fragment of the Almohadasita meteorite, an 88-ton space rock that exploded over the Nubian desert in Sudan. This rare meteorite is thought to have formed in the very early years of the solar system, perhaps even before the Earth itself was born. Tiny gemstones inside the meteorite offer a clue for where the rocks were formed. These meteorites are from the stony family of meteorites, so they are basically full of rocks. And then one of the peculiar characteristics of them is that they have diamonds. And diamonds, to form, they need high pressure, so they should be really deep inside the planet. It's impossible for diamonds like these 
to form inside small asteroids. It takes a rock the size of a planet to create the pressures that are needed. This means that diamonds and Farhang's meteorite were once part of a young planet that got destroyed. Finding a diamond inside of a meteorite means that that meteorite was once under high temperatures and high pressures, and that could only occur inside of a planetary body. If this object is then broken up by a catastrophic collision, those diamonds can be incorporated into an asteroid, a small asteroid. Are these diamonds a relic from a long-lost super-Earth? Farhang looks inside the diamonds themselves to see if there are clues to the size of the planet they came from. When diamonds are forming, they trap minerals inside, and those things are called inclusions. It's like when you are freezing water, you put a small piece of stone, at the end you have that inside the ice. We want to cut out those diamonds and look at those inclusions and study and see what we can know about this ancient planet. Different minerals form at different pressures. If Farhang can identify the raw materials trapped inside these diamonds, he'll know the size of the planet they were formed in. The only trouble, the mineral grains are tiny, as fine as a human hair. Luckily, Farhang has access to a multi-million dollar microscope, one of the most advanced of its kind in the world. So, this is the transmission electron microscopes. Similar to, let's say, biological microscope, instead of light, it's electrons going through the sample. And here is the sample that we are going to insert inside. Moments later, the results are in, and they reveal a surprise. The planet should be at least about Mercury to Mars size to have such a pressure in its interior and form these inclusions and diamonds. The diamonds are unlikely to have come from something the size of a super-Earth. But could their planet of origin have become part of the rubble pile created by Jupiter? These meteorites, they have characteristics that shows that they are probably it has formed somewhere quite close to Jupiter, but in the inner side of Jupiter, closer to the Sun. Farhang's incredible analysis proves that our solar system had at least one long-lost planet. We'll have to wait for evidence of the mysterious super-Earths to emerge. But if they did exist, one question still remains. How did the Earth and other rocky planets come to take their place? <laughs>